Hello, everybody. Tonight, we start a new show in the series. We, tonight, we have some special guests. We have Big Bill Graham. We have Andy Crawford, Miles Hale. Now, these guys you know, but now we have a couple of new people. We have uh, Robert Holloman and Tom Kovicic from Tom's Trains. And Tom's Trains and Things, pardon me. So far in this series, we've covered Is the Hobby Dying? Youth in the Hobby. And tonight we're doing Freelance versus Prototype. So, mm, might be interesting, might create some, some uh, heated discussions. We'll see how it goes. And then uh, in the future, we have uh, what's the role of the NMRA in the hobby. So without further ado, let's move on to our guests. So on this episode, we will be talking with quite a few strong-minded people here on different items. And tonight's topic is freelance versus prototype railroading. Um, in, in my connection or my, my time in, in model railroading, I've seen and heard some things that can't be repeated. But uh, I'm sure we'll get to the bottom of it and we'll find out who's a freelancer and who's a prototyper and to what degree. So who wants to go first? No takers? Come on. Okay. <laughs> All right. One of the things that I found when people come into the hobby, beginners, they, there's two groups. There's ones that just want to get trains running and the other group have preconceived ideas and <clears throat> want to see a replica of something that they remember or have seen or whatever. And I think everybody to some degree is a prototyper, but I think mostly we're all freelancers, mainly because we cannot replicate it, ex uh, the real world exactly. Due to space, size, uh, amount of room that you have to do a certain thing, I mean, some, some uh, let's say a building, a, a, a beer factory, it's going to take up so much room. You may, you may need your garage just to do that module. So we move on and we compress things to make them look good. No takers, still no well, takers. No, I, you're right. I, I'm, I'm right in there. I, I agree with you. I, I think that in, in my own, uh, journey in this when i got started back in 1981 you know i had uh i had a four by eight sheet of plywood on a pair of horses and i painted it brown to simulate dirt and i put the atlas snap track together in a figure eight with uh with a uh, siding on the side and i ran my uh union pacific or santa fe blue and orange that everybody knew and had and about eight box cards and that was great. And I think what happens is, you, you know, and I, I, I think that's the way to go and start. But then I think what happens is, you, you know, you, we, I think we all get visions of grandeur. I, I think we want bigger. We want better. We want to be the best of the best and have that model railroad layout that we see on. I, I remember, and this is kudos to Miles. I remember going to, um, you know, the hobby shop in New Jersey and picking Miles DVDs up at the time, you know, and going home and watching them and then saying to myself, oh, man, I can never do what this guy does. And Has he been around that long? Uh, oh, yeah. yes. <laughs> he has. But what my point is, is that, you know, watching his DVDs, you know, it, two things happen. You either get very intimidated and yeah. saying, I can't do that. Or you say, what the heck? I have nothing to lose. I took the ladder 
and said, what the heck, I have nothing to lose, and ventured in, did everything that you required. I went and joined the club because even though I worked in the transportation, in the subway system, I didn't know everything there was to know about model railroading. So I joined a local club out here, and I got initiated into it, you know, whether it was just – and the first thing I did – on my, on my road to this was I went in and they said, you know, we need somebody to make trees. So I was like, okay, I'll make them. So I made the best tree ever, the straightest tree ever, the best foliage on the tree until the guy <laughs> who is our math. In fact, he is a master model builder. I don't know his name, but I can look him up. Very nice gentleman, exquisite modeler. We were in the Snug Harbor Cultural Center, and he said, Bill, let me take you outside. I want to show you something. And we went outside to the beautiful grounds of the Snug Harbor Cultural Center, and he says, I want you to look at the trees. Do you see a perfect tree here? And I was like, no. He says, they're all gnarly, and they're all, you know, they're out of shape, but they're trees. Nothing's changed them. They're still trees. So he, then he held my tree up. And he says, this tree belongs in Plasticville. And we're not doing plastic. So that was my first introduction into it doesn't have to be so, you know, what's the word? Anal. That's the best I can come up with. I, I agree with that. Now, there are guys in the hobby that at least he took the time to gently point it out to you, constructive criticism. But there are guys that are so gung-ho about prototype that if you don't do it right, you're not modeling. Well, and I, we had a client one time that told us that he wanted the exact model of the exact set where he grew up and he had a photograph frozen in time. And he said, I literally want to model every tree in this photograph. And he meant model the trees in the photograph as they were. I mean, you know, some people are just absolutely berserk, in my opinion, but that's beside the point, that they're going to follow exactly to the prototype. <laughs> and it all goes back, excuse me, <clears throat> it all goes back to what Ralph said at the beginning. There is absolutely no way that you can copy the prototype. You can come close. You can give the illusion, back to Disney's theory, but to actually make a shrunken reel, no one can do it. I'm sorry, it's just not possible. In the first place, if a boxcar weighs 110,000 pounds sitting on the rail, there is no way that you can actually scale that weight down in any of the scales that we're in. I mean, I don't think I could even do it with my inch and a half live steam garden railroad out in the backyard. And that's six, seven foot long cars. You just cannot take that weight and put that much mass into a smaller scale. It just doesn't work. So the first thing out of the box is you're not going to be perfect. It's not going to be 100%. And realize that and then go about doing it as best you possibly can. But, and I agree. So a couple of points I'd like to draw attention to is that, the uh, like Bill was saying when he had saw your work before, there's two ways to view what other people do. And this reflects some on some of the animosity and, and non-constructive criticism of the hobby is if you are, if you are from a beginner to an intermediate or whatever, and you see someone whose work is superior to what you're self judging yourself at, there's two ways to take that. You can take it as intimidation or as inspiration. Um, and you can see it either way. I see people who are doing a lot better than me as inspiration, even though there's some of those guys that I, I'm never going to have the certain aptitude in, in art or color theory or whatever work. I'm still inspired to go after as high a level as I can personally attain within my own skill set. And I think that, that all of us should reach to that. All modelers should reach to whatever the highest level they can achieve in, in some area. Uh, on their uh, willingness to invest time and resources to, you know, depending on the uh, the importance of that particular aspect of the hobby to them. Uh, you know, if they're interested in weathering or electronics or whatever, they may not go as far in some other areas. I agree, I agree with 100% with one third option. There's the, 
<laughs> yeah. All right. You can see things this better than I am. He's worse than him. I don't care. I'm doing what I want. You can see it as inspiration or intimidation, or it may just not impact what you're doing. I see all kinds of other people's work that is awesome, but it doesn't impact mine. It's not what I'm necessarily interested in. So indifference. There's the third eye. I was looking for another eye. So, so you can be intimidated, indifferent, or uh, or inspired by it. But you have to have some, if you love this stuff, you're going to be affected by it in some way. And I think inspiration is the better way to to be affected because you can get there. On the prototype. Freelance, I think, I think it's the idea that we've all that we we're trying to paint people into corners all the time with this stuff, and and I just don't think that you can that you can do that. And I think that people who say they are prototype modelers, I do say that I'm a prototype modeler, and I'm as stickler as anybody in our community that I that I know of for for trying to achieve prototype fidelity. But I am not a prototype modeler, not strictly to the use of the words. If you're a prototype modeler. You could build a box car or a covered hopper or a, or a depot. You could build something like that with spectacular prototype fidelity and accuracy. But the moment you try to scale that, it's a scalability problem. If you are build, if you are a layout builder, and I am not a diorama builder, a structure builder, a rolling stock builder, I'm a layout builder. So prototype has to go out the window or has to be a scale. So I think of, of this as a zero to a hundred percent of the prototype fidelity where, where nobody is truly zero unless you're making up all your rolling stock or if you're maybe running one of those taco futurist trade sets. Remember, you used to go up the wall, that kind of oh, stuff. Yeah. There, that's the freelance modeling. And if you're a prototyper, you could prototype a, a small section, a diorama, a structure, a piece of rolling stock, but you can't get to a hundred percent and be a layout builder. So everybody's across this zero to a hundred spectrum, somewhere between twenty-five and seventy-five, probably. I, what, okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay, what all I was going to say in in what Andy was saying, uh, and I, I've seen it happen. You have an eastbound westbound line, lane or line, and you have a, a train station. And the train station is on the south side of the track. In real life, how do you model it? Do you model it on the south side or do you model it on the north side so that you can, it's more pleasing to the eye? That's a good dividing line, actually. I'd say if, if you're willing to make that sacrifice, then you're just slightly further to the fictitious or freelance. And I like the use right. of fictitious better than freelance because you could be a diehard prototype modeler in every way the railroad would, like Bill Darby's Bobby route. That's as prototype accurate model, uh, of a railroad as there is, but he's modeling a railroad that didn't exist. So he's very prototype, uh, faithful to a prototype, but it's a fictitious prototype. You can't call those guys freelance. Uh, that's that's not a, I don't think you could call that freelance. That's prototype modeling. It just happens to be a fictitious railroad. We don't have a spot for all these things. If you're going, if you're going to be putting that station the actual way that it is, say you're looking at the back of it, you're not going to be seeing anything. You're not going to be seeing any action. So you right. to turn it around to to see what's going on in that station. So you can't actually do prototypical in that sense. You have to you have to uh, sway what you're doing to get uh, the result that you want. I have sections on my layout that I had that I envisioned when I was a kid. And I'm not an artist or anything, anything close to it, but I, I made it as close to what I thought it would be. And I go back to look at it, you know, 50 years later, and I'm nowhere close to what it was. That's, you know, it's how your perception is of, you know, what you're thinking of. I just want to add one thing. Gil Freitag, one of my heroes down in Houston, <laughs> Texas, he always says, Take that model and finish it all the way around because we never know next week, next month, next year, where that building's going to be on our layout. It may move. It may shift. And just because it's the backside this week doesn't mean that next year it won't be the front side. So don't put cardboard on the backside. Go ahead and finish that building out so that you know that it's available to you and you can put it any place you want on your layout at any time. Well, unless you, unless unless you want what I do with my buildings here, I got... You know, I got them facing this way, but I also finish off the back because yeah. I know 
I'm this isn't going to be forever. You know, I, I switch things around on my layout all the time, so I might be looking at the back of it the next time. Right. Well, well, you, well, guys, you watch the video, you do a good job. Oh, un unless you. You, unless you model like Earl Smallshaw, who tries to give you that perspective of depth, uh, he doesn't do the back of the building. He may only do two faces of a building, so that you, when when you're looking at it, you're looking at the one corner, and the, and the open side is to the back. What? How about well, and, prep. and that makes sense in his case because his are so modified that you could reuse them if you wanted to in just a, a range of selection. Although it, in Gil Freitag's arguments defense of this, how many of us ever thought that you'd have a little camera you could stick on a flat car or a gondola and shove it around the layout? And if, yeah, you, yeah. Don't, and if you don't design your layout with that in mind, you're going to see a lot of less than beautiful stuff when you when you first see the camera around. I've tried to keep that in mind as I built my layout. Now, we're all going to design our layouts for the viewability from the aisle. That's the most critical thing you can do. And manipulating viewing angles is something I've taken a great, uh, you know, great uh, strides in, in trying to manipulate. But being able to put a camera on a flat car will, will change your viewing perspective and how much work you need to put into unseen angles as well. Okay. Yeah, on, the, on the depo debate, I put it on the south side. If that's where it was, that's where it is. I don't condemn people who make that sacrifice at all. And I, I it's it's entirely up to you what, what is most important to you. To me, I do care a tremendous amount about the actual fidelity to the prototype. In my case, you know, the prototype side. What I've done is did the track in such, in such a way that you can get the front viewing angle by not having it go straight across the center by shifting it to one side so you can still view the front by manipulating the viewing angles as opposed to having to sacrifice from the prototype. Anyway, in this uh, situation, what I'm about to share with you right here, if you can see it, is the, uh, this is what I model, the Bush Terminal, Bush Terminal building. Now, this is all the railroad and going into the dock. Uh, prototypically, I could never fit this on my layout, never, you know, but I have to have the, uh, the ability. No, I know. I took it down. The ability to compress that and to make it as real as possible, you know, and, and what I model. Sure, would I like to model the intricate curves into the, you know, the, the tight, you know, uh, media turns into the buildings themselves? Yeah. But I think that, you know, I, I think going back in the, the conversation that Andy started originally about being a beginner, moderate, I, we all start to get the prototypical. We all start at being beginning. I think what happens through the we want to try to replicate as much as possible. But I think that to get to that prototypical level of like I want it to be the exact. I, I, personally, to, I think, to, oh, go ahead. To, to become to become the 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 modeler that we want to, we have to be able to accept failure in certain things and move on from those failures. Learn from them. So everybody at some point wants to do prototypical and you try, if it doesn't work, you try something else and you keep moving on until you perfect what you want. That's why some people are on their fourth and fifth layouts. Andy? Start playing. It 13? Okay. So. Um, go ahead, Ralph. I'm sorry. Wind it up on a question. Hmm. So, so my debate would my debate kind of boils down to I think we've tried to paint people into one corner or the other, and I think it's a spectrum as we all realize it is. But we've tried to narrow people and put titles on people, and what that I think has done is encourage these rivet counters and non-constructive criticism that are happening in the hobby that causes a certain group of people to condemn people who are freelance and a certain group of people to condemn those that are that are encouraging in, in prototype. So I think there's a divide happening in our hobby that is entirely unnecessary. Well I've never had I've never had that situation where someone actually came out and was bitter against me because I'm a freelance or 
I don't do what they do. I mean, maybe being six foot two and three hundred and ten pounds has something to do with it. Yeah. But <laughs> I, I don't know. But just just a bit intimidating. That's all. <laughs> but I think I think the I think the thing is you're also and if I'm mistaken, please let me know. I think you're also dealing with the ego here. Absolutely. Like, I mean, I, I, I have to say that I've gone to, you know, I've, I've been to Amherst a couple of times, and I've met a spectrum of master modeler builders, you know, who've ranged. And, I've, and, 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 and most of these guys have been the friendliest of the friendlies. I mean, they, they've been, you know, I sat down next to one guy when it, Miles was doing a clinic on how to, you know, build a simple shed. And the guy next to me turns out that he was like being – he was making mistakes and joking with me and I was telling him, oh, this is, and he was encouraging. I've never really, I think it's based on who you're talking to and how it comes across. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, all, it, it's emotional, it's ego. And, and we all know, we've all been around the block a couple of times. You run into these people, what do you do? You 86 it out of there quick because you, you're not going to learn anything from this. Guy. There's, there's two rules on my, on my railroad. The first one, it's my railroad. The second one, if you don't, if you see something on my layout that you disagree with or you don't like something, refer to rule number one. Right. Absolutely. So it all comes. It all comes down to satisfying yourself. That's right. number one. If that's what it's all people, about. Just to have fun. People, exactly. If people like it in the meantime, that's a bonus. Yeah. You're you're absolutely right. You're absolutely correct. I uh, I think that's the whole thing. In a nutshell. And the and the difference comes into what makes you happy. That's right. There you go. Hmm. Okay. So, I think we may have some more on this and. Uh, We'll discuss it in the next chapter or episode or whichever you'd like to call it. We will see you on the flip side. Hi, this is Big Bill coming to you from YouTube Model Builders. I hope you've enjoyed this discussion tonight that we presented to you. Uh, please tune in next Friday after 3 p.m. when we will post another discussion on Model Railroad Views. Thank you for watching. Take care. God bless, and we'll see you on the radio.